think we can take the masks off if yes, we yes, are this far away. Yeah. Good evening. Welcome. It's wonderful to see all of you here. It's been so exciting today, tomorrow, to have in-person events once again. So thank you so much. I'm Sarah Pritchard. I'm the Dean of Libraries and the Charles Deering McCormick University Librarian. I'm joined here by the Dean of the Medill School, Charles Whitaker. Um, and normally we see each other on Zoom at business meetings for the Dean's Council, so this is much more fun. It is, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> what a change. Uh, to begin our program, it is important to acknowledge that this campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Odawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about native peoples and the institution's history with them. And it's within the library's responsibility to ensure that our collections support this work. Thank you for joining us this evening. The libraries have kicked off reunion weekend for nine years now with a lecture aimed at all of the alums on topics that we hope you will find of interest. And this is not the first time we have featured Medill. Our first dive into journalism was an evening discussing the Daily Northwestern with Christine Brennan and Michael Wilbon, who were just in the other tent. Um, <laughs> Rance Crane and moderated by my colleague Charles Whitaker. This was in 2013. Uh, we again featured notable Medillions in 2016 for a panel discussion on politics with alumnus Al Fromm and Medill professor Ellen Shearer. And we are so pleased to be with you this evening celebrating the centennial of Medill with all of you and you will hear about the most amazing archival acquisition that is unbelievably perfect to celebrate this centennial. Charles, thank you for partnering with us this evening. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. It is really a pleasure and an honor to partner with the library to help celebrate the centennial. Um, before we start, I did want to say earlier this week, it was announced that my colleague Sarah Pritchard will be retiring at the end of the academic year. And I just want, I know. She, I've been associated with Northwestern for more than 45 years. And I can say that in the 15 years that she has been leading the library, she has been a transformational presence and also a wonderful colleague. So I've enjoyed our time together. So I wish you <laughs> This evening marks our first in-person celebration of our centennial. We, in 2018, we started thinking about our centennial, and we had these great plans to have all these in-person events around the world, and then COVID hit, and those all, you know, went kaput. Uh, but here we are, and it's wonderful to be able to see you all in person for this celebration. A uh, hundred years ago, more than a hundred years ago, on February 8th, 1921, uh, Joseph uh, Medill Patterson assembled a group of dignitaries down at Tribune Tower on North Michigan Boulevard, um, and they had a pro pro progression procession up here to Evanston to cut the ribbon on what be what would become the Medill School of Journalism and. We are one of the few institutions that I can say almost from its inception was recognized as a premier institution in its field. We're here today to hear about that wonderful history, all the people who have gone into making Medill the fine institution and premier school of journalism and integrated marketing communications that it is, but also, as Sarah suggested, to hear about an amazing acquisition that, we, uh, that the, the library has just had of the uh, papers and archives of um, Colonel Robert R. McCormick, towering Tribune publisher and also a towering figure within the lifespan of Medill. So thank you for joining us, uh, Sarah.
So I will introduce our speakers for the evening, Kevin Leonard and Ben Joseph, who both work at university libraries. Kevin Leonard has worked in the university archives since 1980, has been the university archive archivist since 2009. He is a walking encyclopedia. He's a walking 30 volume encyclopedia. Um, he directs the archives in collecting and providing access to university related historical records and administrative records, as well as the career records of notable alums who did wonderful things even after they left the campus. Kevin promotes this history through frequent presentations to alumni, student, and community groups. I'm sure at least some of you have already heard some of these great talks that Kevin does, as well as with his curatorial colleagues, creates and produces exhibits and publications. He's a double graduate of Weinberg, first in 1977, then again in 1982, with uh, the second degree was a master's degree uh, in history. Uh, ben Joseph is Northwestern Library's head of archival processing. This is a very elaborate type of work. This is sorting through all the boxes, which is a huge understatement. Processing archives, especially when they come straight out of somebody's basement or garage, um, is a daunting, daunting task. Now, the McCormick Archive did not come out of a... <laughs> I hope they're not heading toward the library. <laughs> Maybe someone was feeling ill in the we other... We in the parking lot, so we called the NAPD. He's oh. leading. Okay. I hope they're all right. Well, let's hope that person is all right. Um, so, uh, so Ben Joseph, head of archival processing, has been with Northwestern since 2009, starting as a manuscript librarian in the Charles Deering McCormick Library of Special Collections, and then also in university archives. Took a little break, left us for a couple years to be the head of university archives and special collections at Illinois Institute of Technology. We lured him back when we created the archival processing department, which had not existed before, and we said to ourselves, Ben is perfect. We have to get him back for this role. Ben holds a master's degree in library science from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Please join me in welcoming Ben Joseph and Kevin Leonard. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to try using this microphone and see if it works out. Thank you, Sarah and Charles, for that wonderful introduction. Um, so I'm really happy to be here speaking to everyone on this occasion of the 100th anniversary of the Middle School of Journalism. Um, I, I'm going to see if this clicker works, and it looks like it does. So um, I'm not actually going to be talking about the uh, 100 years uh, since the founding of Medill. I'm going to talk about what happened uh, in the 100 years before that time, uh, and then maybe a little bit after that as well, um, kind of telling a story through uh, an archival acquisition that we received from the um, uh, uh, First Division Museum at Cantini. Uh, it's something that uh, has to do with uh, Joseph Medill, Robert McCormick, and records of the uh, Chicago Tribune. Uh, we call this the McCormick Archive. It's like the, the, this massive acquisition that we received at Northwestern that's like 200 different archival collections. Um, and it's, it's very fascinating. But um, anyway, so my name is Ben Joseph. Um, uh, as you heard, I'm the head of um, archival processing collection services uh, over at uh, the library. So my unit handles all of the acquisition, um, processing, uh, cataloging, and stacks management for the um, uh, uh, McCormick Library. So I get the pleasure of seeing everything as it comes in. It's, uh, it's a pretty cool job, and uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, that all happens over at Deering Library, which you've, you've probably been to um, before. Sorry. Uh, on the first floor of, of Deering is where all of our operations are. So if you're ever in the neighborhood, you can stop by and see what we've got going on. Um, also, if you're interested in seeing any of the materials that we have described in our Finding Aids database, uh, you can find them at that link there. And that includes everything I'm going to be talking to you about tonight. Um, you can actually come and see these things if you'd like. 
Uh, so I'd like to talk about a couple of people tonight. Robert McCormick is one, and Joseph Medill. Um, I'll start with McCormick. So as you know, McCormick ran the Chicago Tribune starting as its president in 1911 uh, until his death in 1955. He got involved with this because um, it was the family business, and uh, he was looking for something to do. And in fact, um, it was his psychoanalyst, Carl Jung, that told him to get involved. Uh, and, and yes, those letters are in this collection, if you're interested in seeing those. Uh, under McCormick's direction, the Tribune had fantastic growth, uh, and it ended up having um, the uh, leading the world in newspaper advertising revenue. Uh, so it was with funding from the Tribune and backing from McCormick that the Medill School was founded um, in 1921, and he named it for his grandfather, Joseph Medill. Uh, so Medill was born in 1823 in New Brunswick, uh, and he became the Tribune's managing editor in 1855 when he bought the Tribune in partnership with uh, Charles Ray, C.H. Ray. Um, so you can see uh, d on, the, on the right is Medill, on the left is a collection notice uh, that um, they've issued to uh, 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 someone who hasn't paid their bills, right? It's like, hey, pay up or you know, you're in trouble. And uh, you can see it's uh, signed uh, Ray Medill and Company because that, that was it, that was, the whole, that was the whole business at the time. This is from the Office of the Press and Tribune. Um, uh, that was what it was called in 1858 until 1860 is when it became the um, Chicago Daily Tribune. So Medill was strongly anti-slavery. Uh, he was an abolitionist. And um, he was also a major supporter of Abraham Lincoln. In the 1850s, he was instrumental in getting Lincoln um, uh, nominated as a presidential candidate. Uh, and so there's correspondence in the collection between Medill and Lincoln um, at this time. He actually ran... Um, uh, well, he left the Tribune right before the end of the Civil War uh, and got involved in politics. He actually uh, was the mayor of Chicago for a couple of years after the Great Fire. Uh, so, yeah, so we call this the McCormick Archive, uh, but there's so much more in it. Uh, not, not only uh, uh, Robert McCormick materials, Medill's uh, papers, his family's papers, his ancestors, um, all the records of the Chicago Tribune from this point in time up through like the 1970s. Um, so this really is the place to do that research, and it's all um, over in Deering Library right now. Uh, okay, so what's here? Um, I'm going to just show you some examples that I've come across that I think are really interesting, uh, but there's so much. Again, this is just scratching the surface. Uh, we only have a short time together, but um, this, is, this is what I found pretty interesting. Uh, a lot of it's going to be in the McCormick Business Records or the Tribune Company archives. So you'll find all sorts of things, you know, from... Uh, business ledgers to very extensive documentation of McCormick setting up paper mills in Canada, not unlike Henry Ford's efforts to uh, create a, a rubber plantation in uh, Brazil, which is going on at the same time. That's an interesting story, too, if you know that. There are still uh, small towns in Quebec that have monuments to McCormick, like this one, where you can actually get in the canoe with him as he's discovering this amazing new land uh, to... Uh, build his paper mills. Um, he was really involved in the daily activities of the paper, and so this is, uh, you know, even with the funny pages, so this is him telling Chester Gould uh, what the next Dick Tracy comic should be. <laughs> and you can see he's only too happy to oblige. <laughs> uh, this is a letter from Amelia Earhart, um, and I believe this, this letter might have actually been used in the invitation to this event. I think it's kind of funny. I wanted to include it here just because this letter is actually um, Earhart asking McCormick to stop using her name uh, in connection with an aviation event that's being planned in Chicago. <laughs> Better to ask for forgiveness than permission, I guess. This is another aviator, Charles Lindbergh. Um, he's thanking McCormick in this case for supporting his testimony uh, to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee against becoming involved in World War II. So uh, Lindbergh and McCormick were both um, part of the isolationist or the non-intervention movement at that time. They didn't want, didn't want to get involved. I gotta say though, McCormick's career wasn't all puppy dogs and rainbows, as they say. Uh, he wouldn't admit it, but he was, like most everyone in his generation, a product of his time. So the way that he understood race and ethnicity um, 
might have been considered enlightened in the 1930s, but it's really not by today's standards. Uh, I know that doesn't surprise anyone here, um, but there are plenty of materials in these collections that can actually tell us something about how editorial practice has changed uh, or were evolving during this time. On the one hand, we have McCormick asking his sports editor about, quote, mixed race athletic performance based on color of skin. Uh, this is his sports editor's response. I'm not going to read it for you here, but I include it for, uh, just for perspective. Um, this was a legitimate question in his mind at this time. On the other hand, McCormick did sometimes publish editorials that were supportive of the black community in Chicago and elsewhere. And this is a letter from Chicago Defender, publisher and founder Robert Sengstack Abbott, uh, about an editorial printed by the Defender. Anyway, the Defender was um, the most important, well-known African-American newspaper of its time. Um, an editorial the Defender printed that the Tribune picked up. Um, this was a big deal at the time, because that editorial was strongly supportive of civil rights many years before that era began in earnest. And this is in 1936. The editorial was about how um, African-American people at this time kept having to rely on the Supreme Court for elementary justice, not just in the South, but in the North as well, because of how local courts and law enforcement operated. Now, this is almost 90 years ago, and it's still something we're talking about a lot today. So as a result, um, there's a lot of correspondence here between McCormick and Abbott, who exchanged many friendly letters over the following years. Practically speaking, um, this editorial was also uh, very critical of FDR's New Deal, uh, and McCormick was very anti-New Deal. So he, th there, was a, there was a double kind of thing going on there. So it was politics, probably. So politics definitely factors in here. Let's jump back to Joseph Medill. Uh, remember that Medill took over the newspaper in 1855, the Chicago Tribune, and turned it into the main paper of the Republican Party. This is the party of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, so as such, there's many letters from Medill, between Medill and Lincoln here. Uh, this one is Lincoln writing to Charles Ray, the editor-in-chief, to protest an editorial that accused his friend George Davis of seeking to undermine the U.S. House candidacy of fellow Republican Owen Lovejoy politics. I don't even understand what that says. Um, but you know, here he says, uh, 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 thoughts like this plant poisonous thorns in the party. This is another letter uh, from Lincoln to Joseph Medill. Here he is defending himself against a story that uh, claimed, falsely claimed, according to him, uh, that he voted against appropriations for soldiers fighting in the Mexican-American War during his lone U.S. House term. Uh, in his blind rage to assail me, Lincoln says, you have seized on a vague recollection of Henry's vote and appropriated it to me. Uh, he's getting a, little, getting a little upset in this letter. Uh, this one, uh, some Lincoln scholars, as I understand it, uh, agree this is Lincoln's angriest letter. Here he's writing to Charles Ray, uh, furious over the Tribune's endorsement of a Democrat who, if I can get this right, opposed the pro-slavery Lecompton Constitution in Kansas the Lecompton Constitution was one of four proposed constitutions in Kansas while it was seeking statehood. How in God's name do you let such paragraphs into the Tribune? That's one of my favorites. Uh, this is just Lincoln renewing his subscription to the newspaper. <laughs> but you can, see, you can see it's a much softer tone, and he expresses how much gratitude he owes to the Chicago Tribune. And finally, things were looking good for Lincoln's presidential bid towards, then. this is 1860 uh, in September, very close to the election. And uh, he's writing again to Joseph Medill, and he's saying, we cannot be beaten in Illinois. He's speaking about um, if the numbers in the state hold true. Of course, Lincoln was elected president, um, and that galvanized the Confederate states. So they began to secede from the Union, beginning with South Carolina. Now. This is what that eventually looks like. Um, you've got like the, so there's the Union states uh, up on top in blue. There's the Confederate states on, uh, in orange uh, down below. And then there's a line of yellow states kind of uh, in the middle. Uh, and so these are the states that were alleging they were neutral uh, or they were still allowing slavery, but they were resisting the Confederacy. So right after that letter was written, Lincoln uh, was elected. And uh, he told General Fremont, who's this other this guy on the right, uh, hey, you've got to go to Missouri 
and you've got to break off the western half of the Confederacy. Um, we don't want them to secede. You've got to squash those secessionist ideals. So he did. So he goes to Missouri, and he does his best. But after about six months, things aren't looking good. The Confederates are um, they're wrecking trains. They're cutting telegraph lines. Um, so what Fremont does is he issues this, this order, uh, August 30th, 1861, without notifying President Lincoln, he issues a proclamation that puts Missouri under martial law. It declares that civilians taking up arms against Union soldiers be executed. Uh, he says that property of those who aid secessionists, anyone who wants to secede, will be confiscated. And slaves of all rebels were immediately freed. So this last clause caused a lot of concern uh, to Lincoln, especially because Kentucky was still neutral. And so he's thinking, that's going to push them over the edge. They're all going to secede. The Union won't survive. So abolitionists cheered Fremont's uh, uh, proclamation. But Lincoln said, you've got to take it back. You've got to walk that back. Uh, and he wouldn't. He wouldn't do it. So. Uh, Lincoln issues an order revoking publicly the emancipation part of these, um, uh, th this, this proclamation that Fremont has issued. Abolitionists attacked Lincoln for doing this. Uh, uh, yeah, they attacked him uh, just terribly. Uh, one of those abolitionists was our very own Joseph Medill. Uh, so this is a letter in the collection written five days after Lincoln publicly revokes that order. And so Medill writes to Lincoln, and you can see um, up at the top, it says, Dear Lincoln, it's marked confidential, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. <laughs> President Lincoln, your letter to General Fremont has cast a funeral pall over our loyal city, Chicago. We are stricken with a heavier calamity than the rout at Bull Run. It comes like a mildew like a frost in June, killing the coming harvest. If there was one thing above another on which the whole people were agreed. It was in support of Fremont's noble proclamation. This is emancipating enslaved people in Missouri. Democrats vied with Republicans in eulogizing it and defending its positions, but that proclamation and the pervading belief that you endorsed it had revived enlistments and rekindled flagging enthusiasm. Since you have vetoed the penalties against the misdeeds of slaveholding rebels, the war will degenerate into duels and assassinations. Mr. President, this is a slaveholder's rebellion. Slavery is at the bottom of the whole trouble. Now, this goes on for several pages, but I'm going to skip to the end, where it says, yours in grief, Joseph Medill. <laughs> now, Lincoln and Medill did remain in contact after this, so don't worry, they might not have been BFFs. Uh, it turned out OK for them uh, until Lincoln was assassinated, of course, but that's another story uh, for another time. And I believe I am out of time now. So um, I'm going to skip to the end of this as well and just say, um, if you'd like to access any parts of this collection, you can send an uh, email to specialcollections at northwestern.edu, um, set up an appointment. Our reading room is open Monday through Friday, 9 to 4.30. Um, there are no digitization plans for any of these collections at this time, but it's very likely that some parts of them will be digitized uh, in the future. Um, so that's what I've got. Hope this has been enjoyable for you. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Leonard now to speak more about other resources that we have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben, um, and thank you, um, people tonight for coming out on this evening. Uh, good evening, Wildcats. It's a pleasure to be here. I was tipped off a little earlier that the bar would be closing during my stint at the podium. <laughs> and I know you're all news people. So if you want to get up and move, I won't be offended. OK, so um, I want to piggyback on, on what Ben has done and tell you about other collections held by Northwestern University Libraries that relate to journalists and journalism. I'm not here to tell you the story of the, uh, the Medill School, the history of the, of the school. There are people who are far better equipped to do that. Um, I see Al Cubbage here. Roger, Roger, are you here tonight? Yeah, Roger, boy. Uh, perhaps you know these gentlemen. Um, uh, if you want to know the story of Medill, talk to them afterwards. <laughs> 
Um, so, University Archives, where I work, where Ben works. Um, we are located in Deering Library, and our collections are extensive. And so Sarah, I thank you for that. Sarah has been great to work for and singularly adept at acquiring real estate that has allowed uh, Ben and me and our colleagues to acquire wonderful, special, unique materials. Um, anyhow, the, the, the holdings of the unit eclipse the um, capacity of the building, and we have other storage units, uh, an underground storage uh, area on campus and a massive facility in Waukegan. And the existence of those facilities has allowed us to chase our dreams and, and hopefully provide materials to you, your friends, uh, future generations that, who will study uh, journalism, journalists, and other subjects. The story of journalism at Northwestern begins long before the creation of the Medill School. Students did that on their own, beginning in 1871 with the creation of the first student newspaper. And stu students uh, here cut their teeth on publishing efforts with those newspapers, the, the tripod, then the vedette. Uh, finally, the tripod and the, the vedette were competing uh, titles, and they merged to form the Northwestern. And when the frequency of publication was such, uh, it became the Daily Northwestern. Uh, many of the alumni of those publications went on to careers as reporters and editors. Uh, a number of Northwestern students from the 19th, early 20th century, uh, when Northwestern was more closely, was closely affiliated with the Methodist Episcopal Church, now the United Methodist Church, went on to publishing careers with the various uh, Methodist regional newspapers or the Methodist Publishing House. Um, but um, I'm not here, again, to talk to you about the history of Medill. We do have many collections of Medill administrators and Medill faculty, and you can catch me afterward if you want to talk about that. I want to talk about some other archival collections. And I'm going to start with some Medill people, some Medill alumni, um, who left great collections at Northwestern but not necessarily relating to journalism. I'm going to start with the woman uh, behind the flag there, Karen DeCrow, Medill alumna, who went on, um, uh, got a job with, with Golf Magazine, I believe, out of Medill, but then went on to become a feminist and a very prominent one and a two-term president of the National Organization for Women. We are, we are very fortunate to have Karen's extensive collection of files here, and they're uh, really illuminating um, in regard to women's issues of the, of the latter 20th century. Um, some, some individuals who are, who are connected with Medill and members of the Medill's Hall of Achievement, Jonathan Adelton, Cindy Chupak, George R. R. Martin. Well, we don't have George R. R. Martin's papers, but we do have a few, few uh, items from him. But we have really nice collections uh, from the other two. Uh, Jonathan Adelton um, spent his career as a diplomat, um, in, in government service, and uh, so we have uh, great records of his tenure in various Central Asian countries. Cindy Chupak has gone into, into entertainment. Uh, if you are familiar with the show Sex and the City, uh, that's one of her uh, more notable products. Uh, she has had a, a long and distinguished career um, writing, directing, and producing television and, and movies. Um, and another uh, great collection comes from Al Fromm. Al Fromm was a Medill student, uh, was editor of the Daily Northwestern in the mid-1960s, and is distinguished by being um, a central figure in exposing the um, uh, pernicious Jewish quota that existed at Northwestern at that time and used the Daily Northwestern as a platform to, to push back on that. So the, the, you know the, the story, you, you journalists, uh, never, never pick a fight with someone who buys ink by the barrel. And Al was, was very, uh, very uh, important in changing Northwestern's trajectory when he was a student editor. He went on to um, a political life, serving in the, uh, with Sergeant Shriver, Fourth Sergeant Shriver in the War on Poverty, and then he stayed in politics. And he is best remembered now as the founder of the Democratic Leadership Council. And um, uh, his his collection, which I was fortunate to to pack up and and bring back to Evanston a few years ago, is uh, really really. Um, nicely documents uh, that organization and um, Democratic Party politics um, of the era that brought us Bill Clinton. Uh, Al Fromm was very, uh, very significant in that. And maybe best known of Medill alumni who did not pursue a career in journalism is the uh, um, joke writer, television and movie 
uh, director, producer, writer, Gary Marshall. Um, Gary, uh, wonderful person. I was fortunate in my work here to meet him on four occasions. And um, uh, I noticed when, when you, if you ever read the obituaries when, when Mr. Marshall died and they talked about what a great guy he was, he was every bit that great guy. Uh, we have uh, the first installment of his papers in the archives and it includes uh, documentation of his work in television and movies. Uh, what you're seeing there is a uh, hand-drawn uh, storyboard. We have the storyboards from his most famous movie, Pretty Woman. Uh, but now getting into to people who are actually reporters and columnists and editors, and one of my favorites uh, was Georgie Ann Geyer. Uh, became a, a great foreign affairs reporter and columnist. Uh, that's Georgie Ann Geyer, GG to her friends, uh, obviously on the left. And one of the remarkable items we have in our collection is her portable typewriter, that typewriter that she took with her on assignment across the globe. And of course, that typewriter, uh, its case is marked with a sticker uh, of big bright fire engine red uh, lips, her signature uh, color, as you can see. Uh, but also in that collection, which is very significant in scope, uh, are her reporter's notebooks, her correspondence with prominent individuals, uh, her photographs uh, documenting her career with, with heads of state or important political figures, um, and then some, some materials acquired from other people prominent in the industry, <coughs> including some um, original cartoons from, from noteworthy cartoonists. Uh, James Rosen, who has had a long career with Fox and now Sinclair, uh, his papers are here. James Rosen um, had very important beats in his, in his work, uh, generally covering the White House or the Department of State uh, or the Pentagon and traveled with prominent representatives of, of federal government. And um, his collection, which is voluminous, includes a great deal of documentation pertaining to uh, high government affairs in the relatively modern period. He also is the biographer of the former Attorney General John Mitchell. And in writing that biography, he compiled a tremendous resource relating to Watergate. Um, including scores and scores of magnetic recordings of his interviews with nearly everyone associated uh, with Watergate and the Nixon administration at, at uh, the time of Watergate. Milan Kubic, um, uh, his collection came in about a year ago, and it's, it's a terrific one. Milan uh, was a refugee who found his way from Central Europe, who found his way to the United States, and um, ultimately to the Medill School, and he became a reporter and spent a good part of his career with Newsweek magazine covering Central Europe, South America, and also the Middle East. And his... Um, uh, his correspondence with uh, prominent figure, figures in Middle Eastern uh, statecraft are in the collection, as well as transcriptions of his interviews with some really prominent people um, from, from uh, Israel and Palestine. Uh, I'm not going to show you the collection from this gentleman because I didn't have a wide enough angle on my camera uh, lens. Sam Jameson. Sam Jameson, another Medillion, uh, went off to become a foreign affairs reporter posted to Tokyo. And uh, given enough time in Tokyo, he became essentially the dean of the foreign correspondence there. Um, I did not know Sam, but uh, again, I did know Georgie Ann Geyer. And when, when Sam Jameson died, Gigi Geyer called me up and said, do you have Sam Jameson's files? And I said, uh, regrettably, uh, who's Sam Jameson? And, and, and uh, Gigi was a, a kind soul, but she, the, the closest she came to excoriating me was, was that day. And she uh, informed me who Sam Jameson was. And we resolved to get Sam Jameson's files, which was a, a very interesting archival project. Sam was dead, uh, left no issue there. And, and we had to figure out a way to get a very large collection uh, from his Tokyo apartment to Evanston. I thank my colleagues for their help with that. Um, and the customs officials. And it is a wonderful and huge collection that, that details um, uh, Japanese-American relations, Japanese governmental affairs, Japanese business. Sam, from his perch in Tokyo, also covered Korea. And for a period of time when the war was raging, the Vietnam War. Uh, uh, Dick Longworth. Dick Longworth, are you here tonight? No? 
Probably not. Dick Longworth, uh, another foreign affairs reporter um, uh, for, for a long time associated with the Chicago Tribune, uh, also left us a, a massive collection of his personal papers as he reported from the USSR and, and European, uh, various European states. Uh, he's involved with the uh, with, um, Global Affairs, Chicago Council on Global Affairs, um, and his collection is very rich in material that, that document, in particular, uh, the Chicago region's um, significance in foreign trade uh, and exchange. Marilyn Green, um, another lovely collection. Marilyn uh, spent much of her career with USA Today and covered very important stories uh, in Africa, uh, the, the development of AIDS in Africa, uh, covered the, the Persian Gulf War. Um, it is uh, a, a really noteworthy body of material um, relating to her career in depth, but also to some very significant issues um, in world affairs. And um, uh, that's, of course, Marilyn with um, Barbara Bush. Excuse me, if I'm looking this way, I can't really see the screen very well. Uh, oh, heck. Oh, heck. Help Al me here. Borkover. Al Borkover, thank you. Al Borkover's papers here. Uh, Al Borkover, we're moving from foreign affairs to travel and work for the Tribune as, as the uh, travel reporter. So we're were um, uh, well well represented when it comes to uh, uh, activities going on uh, outside the country. But domestically, uh, a really important collection that came in, papers of Dick Longworth. Uh, Dick Longworth is best remembered as the representative um, who secured the, Zabu the Zapruder tape for Life magazine. Dick I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Dick Stolle. Did I say Dick Longworth? Yeah, excuse me, forgive me. Um, Dick Stolle. Uh, uh, secured that, that uh, footage for Life magazine, uh, covered a number of other important stories in his long career, uh, founding editor of People magazine. Normally, the archives does not go after people and ask for their financial, their routine financial records, but this is, these, these ones are pretty significant. What you see there uh, are the expenditures on his trip to Dallas after the Kennedy assassination, um, and... Um, uh, kind of documents in in great, uh, really fine detail um, how he engaged with people to get that story out. Andrew Malcolm, um, a very large co uh, collection of Mr. Malcolm's uh, papers, a long career as a reporter with uh, some of the signature newspapers in the United States, now still active uh, reporting and uh, columnists and doing opinion pieces um, uh, covering uh, just thousands of stories on a, on a variety of issues, but really, really colorful um, collection that I think uh, is most important. Um, transitioning to broadcasting, Merv Block, a member of the Medill Hall uh, of Achievement. Merv Block was, a, was a, a print reporter, but also helped to write the television news and to set standards for how television reporters um, spoke and reported the news. Uh, through broadcast, so his materials have have come in and um, help help to illuminate that that transition point from print to to uh, screen. Um, anyone recognize the little guy uh, top left? Uh, well, I'll give you a hint. If you recognize him, he there he is as an adult in the larger picture. And no, it's not Hubert Humphrey. It's the guy with him. Right? That's that's. Sander Van Oker. Sander Van Oker is not a Medill person, right? He's the, what we now call the School of Communication, but I couldn't leave him out of this story tonight because of in, his importance. And he gained um, his fame largely from his participation in the Kennedy-Nixon debate. Uh, Sander's uh, papers are here, and I got news just yesterday from his son that a large addition to that collection is winging its way to us right now. Um, included in, in the Van Oker papers are the uh, actual scripts from which he read uh, when reporting the news on television. And you can see some stuff, the material from, from the Kennedy-Johnson uh, era right there. Uh, and John Palmer, uh, again, another school of communications person, but very significant in broadcast news, uh, uh, Northwestern alumnus. And uh, uh, Mr. Palmer's family put his collection here with, with Northwestern archives. And this past year, Bobby Batista, who was uh, the first, one of the first um, network anchors for the new CNN 
um, channel uh, uh, we acquired. Bobby s sadly died at a relatively young age, um, and we acquired her surviving papers. Uh, also broadcasting, Bob Mulholland, um, uh, Medill alumnus, but also associated with the Medill faculty, uh, went on to a, a very significant career with NBC, and of course, um, with NBC, um, he guess got himself onto the Johnny Carson show. Uh, that's Bob in the center. Uh, something interesting in in Bob Mulholland's collection are some some courtroom drawings from from. Uh, a couple of notable trials uh, or courtroom proceedings in American history. This happens to be a drawing that was gifted to, to Bob that we have now. It's from the court martial of Lloyd Booker, if, you, if you're old enough like me to remember the USS Pueblo incident. And um, a longtime editor of the Los Angeles Times, Medill alumnus, Bill Thomas. His, his uh, uh, papers came to us, and those are being cataloged um, as of today. Um, in the, uh, the Bill Thomas collection is a letter from another Northwestern alumnus, Charlton Heston. And Heston was complaining about the, some of the stories the LA Times ran, and they were not to his liking. And Bill Thomas responded, and, and um, Heston got back with a very... Uh, generous note. And um, while we are, are top heavy with written materials, we do have some, some three-dimensional artifacts in the collection. And so I grabbed uh, Bill Thomas's briefcase because the way I look at a briefcase, it's like in, in a few more years that people um, won't have seen those. And, and in effect, those are kind of like the, the iPhones of their time, right? It's, it's everything you need is right there in one convenient place. It's just bigger than what we're used to now. Um, oh, real fun collection. Personal papers of Chester Gould, uh, Northwestern alumnus. Went on to a great career as a cartoonist, the creator of Dick Tracy. Um, a lot of Mr. Gould's drawings are at Ohio State University, which has a specialized collection in cartooning. But anyone who wants to know, uh, to read his correspondence and learn more about his life, his biographical details, will have to come here. Um, so those are a uh, very interesting body of material. And Mr. Gould's family uh, sought off a collection of original drawings, which we have here, which are just really stunning when you're able to see them in person. So I invite you to come and, and look at those when you have an opportunity. Uh, Chuck Ramsbury. Oh. Leading from, from Chester Gould and Dick Tracy in crime and whatnot, we have Chuck Remsburg and a massive collection of, of his materials, also in the Medill Hall of, of Achievement. Um, went on to write about a variety of stories, started to focus on crime, true crime, and that led to a career uh, writing on issues associated with police work. Uh, and and uh, Jane Curry. Uh, Jane Curry's materials came in. Jane uh, went from Medill to work in the public affairs unit of the Chicago Police Department. So there's a lot of great material um, in her collection that is associated with some s signal events in, in policing and in Chicago history. And uh, acquired over the last few weeks are the papers of a Chicago journalist, Rob Warden, who's uh, not tied to Medill, but he has been tied to the School of Law here, um, and was has very much been involved with the effort to overturn wrongful convictions. So that is going to be a, a noteworthy collection when we can bring that online. Uh, Bob Lefley. Uh, Bob Lefley worked in radio uh, for a good portion of his career. We are delighted to have his personal papers, but we also have some recordings. And Bob ran a um, uh, public broadcast station series of interviews for a number of years uh, over WB, what we now know as WBEZ. Um, and there are some very, very important literary figures in that collection um, uh, uh, being interviewed live by, by Bob Lefley. And Rance Crane. Um, whose name you're going to recognize from, from the various Crane advertising age, the various Crane's publications, uh, deposited his material here, including his notebooks as a Medill student. So if you want to know how Rance did, um, those are, are with us. And um, uh, we're getting some sizable materials from Howard Tyner, who also became an editor of the Chicago Tribune. 
Um, a real cool collection, the papers of Stanton Cook. That is Stanton Cook standing. Anyone recognize the guy sitting? John Madigan? And look what Stan Cook is doing behind him, all right? <laughs> Um, as well as some, some uh, uh, certainly biographical uh, material in the collection, but it is a huge one. Um, uh, Stan was running the Tribune at a time when anyone promoting a, a political campaign would have to come through the Tribune offices and to the editorial board in the hope of support. Um, he also was very, very active in um, investigating the newly opened um, China when, uh, when our relations between our nations improved. And, and Stan Cook went off with a, a team of journalists to China and a very talented photographer himself. Um, he went and took the photographs that appear in the, the Sunday Tribune magazine from that. And he collected as well many, many um, original documents from China at the time when our uh, bilateral relations uh, changed dramatically. He was also president of the Tribune, running a CEO of the Tribune, at the time when the Tribune acquired the Chicago Cubs. So it's a good baseball collection for you baseball fans. And if any of you are Cub fans of a particular age, if you want to know why Greg Maddox left the Cubs, it's <laughs> there's kind of a, an angry letter in Stan Cook's file that explains that. And so I'll use this as an opportunity to turn to the back of the newspaper to the sports section and tell you what we have uh, there. Um, uh, very proud to have the papers of Murray Olderman, who came to Northwestern after World War II, uh, started cartooning, self-taught cartoonist. Uh, the drawing on the right is of Frank Ashenbrenner. Frank Ashenbrenner was a great football player at Northwestern on that 1949 Rose Bowl team. He was, in fact, the MVP of the 49 Rose Bowl, but that's uh, Mr. Olderman's drawing. Again, this guy is self-taught. He went, moved from cartooning into other forms of sports writing. So he became the biographer of Al Davis of the then Oakland Raiders. He started writing um, more technical books, on, on particularly on football. Uh, the last publication he put out prior to his death a few years ago uh, was a, a book of... Um, what he felt were his more notable cartoons associated with sports. Uh, alumnus Jeff Davis, biographer of George Hallis. His, his papers are here, along with the interview tapes with members of the Chicago Bears, for those of you who are interested in that. Um, and the picture on the right is from a television show that was uh, very popular in Chicago once upon a time called The Sports Writers. And the two gentlemen at the right, uh, Rick Tellender and Bill Jouse, both of uh, co have collections of their career records with Northwestern. The uh, university is, has become very well known for um, the distinguished reporters um, who've been involved with sports, sports writing, um, one of whom is, is here with us tonight. Uh, Willie Weinbaum of ESPN has put some of his material with us. And Christine Brennan, if we can all twist, if we can all think and pray and twist her arms. has promised her personal papers to Northwestern, maybe when she, when she closes up her career. But it would always help if you, we got some under the, under the tent, just, just so we have a claim on you. Christine, thank you for coming here. <laughs> uh, I, I, I bet I could find some. So why have I shown you all this? Why the, the quick glancing uh, tour through ar archival collections? It's first to tell you that what those featured people did was significant. And what you do is significant, and we value what you do here at Northwestern. Second, in your efforts to discern and share the news, to inform this generation, that's impactful in real time. But in my world, that of the archives, real time stretches over a long horizon. It exists far beyond today or this week or this month, and maybe even this year, because our archival holdings inform audiences across the generations. So your work is the so-called first draft of history. But history has many drafts, and maybe it's never finally written. The records that you create and have retained can illuminate your time and the times beyond in multiple ways, many of which might be unexpected, as long as those records ultimately are preserved at an institution dedicated to the creation and dissemination of knowledge, a place such as this. So when you get home tonight, or later this weekend, I'm going to ask you to take a look at that filing cabinet. 
I'm going to ask you to take a look at those boxes that you've stuffed in the closet and kept for way too many years, knowing that you've never really looked at them. And then I want you to give me a call. You know where to find me. I thank you for what you do in your careers. I thank you for your loyalty to Northwestern. I thank you for your presence tonight. Thank you, Kevin. That was magnificent. Even for me, who's in the building every day, we don't know all these things. And I cannot emphasize enough how living are archives. There is nothing old or dead. It is new material created every day. It is the magnificent history of Northwestern and of all of Northwestern's alums. And Kevin didn't say, we take hard drives, too. So, uh, I mean, this is true. We take answering machine tapes, we take disks, hard drives, we save cords so we can match up all the strange random, random bits of technology that we get, people's cell phones. So all formats of recorded information. Um, Sarah, I hate to do this. This is my boss, by the way. I shouldn't interrupt her. May I say one thing? Yes, sure, sir. I forgot. Casey Buckrow, are you here? Yes. yes. Casey? Uh, this is uh, an alumnus of Medill, whose papers we are expecting. Another person, I hope you all twist his arm on the way out, uh, the, 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 our, our first environmental affairs reporter. Um, so a very significant career with very important material. So <clears throat> if you get to buttonhole him, just keep reminding him that we wanted his stuff. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'd, to close out the program, I would like to invite to the podium the chair of the Medill Board of Advisors, alumna Mary Lou Song. I love a good podium because it makes me feel so tall. <laughs> but thank you, Sarah. Um, it's my honor to close out the evening with thanks to Kevin and Ben. Um, for that really fascinating presentation. I love being on campus. I learn something new every time, so thank you. Um, the libraries and university archives are a treasure trove of collections, and I hope you will all um, take the chance and the time to visit them while you're in Evanston this weekend. Um, I'm proud to be a Medill alumna. I'm celebrating my 30th reunion this year. Um, and I'm also honored to be chair of Medill's Board of Advisors, so thank you, Charles. Um, I'd like to acknowledge members of the Library's Board of Governors, the Medill Board of Advisors, and the Board of Trustees who are in attendance this evening. Um, I'd also like to extend a special thank you to Dean of Libraries, Sarah Pritchard, and Dean of Medill, Charles Whitaker. Um, we are so grateful for your extraordinary leadership of these two celebrated Northwestern institutions. And thank you to all of our guests um, for joining us this evening. Um, as Charles mentioned, um, this is the first of what will be many celebrations around the country to mark our centennial. And we hope to see many of you again um, in uh, cities near you um, as we celebrate um, this historic milestone for Medill. Um, I hope you enjoy connecting with your uh, fellow classmates and friends and the Medill community and the Northwestern one as well as we celebrate um, this very long overdue reunion weekend together. So thank you. Have a great evening.